Uh, my name is Robert Cooter. I'm the co-director of the Law and Economics program here at Berkeley, which is the co-sponsor with the Brennan Center of this event. Uh, we're fortunate to have with us the founder and donor of the Brennan Center, Tom Jordy. Tom uh, was a uh, clerk for Justice Brennan. He was a colleague here at the Berkeley Law School. As a matter of fact, we clinked glasses on the same day when we both got tenure. It's quite a pleasure. And Tom went on to a very successful career in business, and we're grateful to him for remembering us and remembering the importance of the academic world uh, when he went on to more lucrative activities. I'd also like to point out that Michael Waldman is here today, who is the president of the Brennan Center. Now, um, my main task is to introduce um, Cass Sunstein, our speaker today. Uh, the outline of his career is familiar. I'm not going to say much about it. You, you can look at it in the handout, if you wish. He was a uh, graduate of Harvard College, where he learned uh, to uh, parry the squash ball, both offensively and defensively, a skill that has served him well mm -hmm. subsequently. He got his JD at the Harvard Law School. He clerked at the Massachusetts Supreme Court and at the Supreme Court of the United States for Thurgood Marshall. He then spent 27 years as a faculty member at the University of Chicago uh, before moving on to Harvard and uh, to the Office of Administrator of OIRA, the Office of Management and Budget, which is the super agency uh, for regulation in the United States. He's returned from that job and is now back at the Harvard Law School. Now, if you look at Cass's writings, uh, I find myself bewildered with envy. I'm envious because Cass is definitely one of the most prolific scholars in the law world. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you take his quantity rated by his quality, I don't think anybody can top him. Uh, and I find it bewildering because he's written on so many topics, I don't really know what to focus on. Cass has written about a book a year, uh, as well as several articles every year, and I'm just not going to talk about that. <laughs> I'm going to say this about Cass, though. Uh, Cass's talk today is called Non-Quantifiable. And if I were to give a title to my remarks to you now, it would be Unclassifiable because Cass's work is uh, paradoxical as well as prolific. One of the great things about a Sunstein article is you don't really know where he's going to come out until you start it. You know that it's going to be rigorous, it's going to be carefully argued, and it's going to be backed by good evidence, social scientific evidence especially, legal evidence, but you don't know exactly what he's going to come, where he's going to come down. So he's a specialist at paradoxes such as this. His regulatory approach is especially known as libertarian paternalism. It seems like you should have one or the other, right? You can have paternalism, you can have libertarianism, but Cass can have both. And if you read his work, you can see why. This is carefully related to his contribution to law and social science, which is especially represented by his popular, well-selling book called Nudge. And the idea of nudge is, of course, that you should not con reduce the choices that people make. That would be anti-paternalist. Uh, but you should, excuse me, that would be anti-libertarian. But you should change the default and such as that to affect the outcome of how they choose. It's a wonderful book. And when you read it, you don't know whether Cass, who's contributed so much, to social psychology and behavioral economics is in fact perfecting law and economics or destroying it. <laughs> I once asked a colleague whether Cass was in favor of, whether Cass was, I, is, is Cass really a law and economics scholar or is he not? And he said, well, you know, I think he is because I've noticed that he leaves his car parked in all kinds of illegal places and he treats it merely as a price and not a moral condemnation. <laughs> Now, it's also hard to say whether Cass is a liberal or a conservative. He campaigned uh, very strongly 
for, uh, he supported very strongly the appointment of Chief Justice Roberts, but he did clerk for Thurgood Marshall. He's, he's uh, been a persistent advocate of many uh, left liberal causes, uh, including some surprising things like animal rights. Well, that's all I want to say about Cass being uh, non-quantifiable, uh, Cass's non-quantifiability being unclassifiable. Uh, I hope you're looking forward to this as much as I am. Now I want to say something about the commentators who are going to be uh, speaking after Cass because we are not going to have separate introductions for the commentators. And the commentators are going to go in the order on the program, which is first our own Dan Farber, the director of the Environmental Law Center here, and one of Berkeley's most prolific scholars, especially in constitutional environmental law. If uh, someone says to me, the dean has formed an important committee on X, I'm likely to say, well, is Dan Farber the chair or only a member? He has been one of our most um, valuable uh, colleagues in the running of the law school. Lisa Heinzerling is a former clerk to Justice Brennan. She's a professor at Georgetown University Law School, and she's held very prominent positions recently in the EPA, including serving as an attorney on significant legal cases involving the agency. Ricky Rivez uh, is a professor at NYU and served as its dean for 11 years, recently resigning. And I would say of Ricky, there are two things that are most remarkable about him. Uh, first of all, he significantly raised the already high ranking of NYU, which is a very difficult thing to do. To change rankings is not easy. And he did it through smart hires, institutional creativity, and the Midas touch with the alums. And the other thing is that all those 11 years when he was dean, he stayed alive intellectually. He wrote a book on cost-benefit analysis and re remains an expert on the field, especially in the area of the environmental law. So that is my introduction. How am I doing? Uh, pretty close. Now we're going to try to keep the time here, and uh, Cass is going to talk until 5.50, and then each of the commentators is going to give their comments. And when that's through, uh, Cass is going to respond to the commentators uh, 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 for 10 minutes. And after that, there will be a brief reception when you will have the chance, if you can get to the front of the room, uh, to uh, uh, talk to the speakers and the com and the commentators, the speaker and the commentators yourself. Yes. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Bob, for that incredibly kind introduction. And um, amazed that all of you are here. There's a lot of people. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm thrilled to be here for a number of reasons, and I'll uh, kind of back into the uh, the number one reason. When um, uh, when I was first uh, almost dating my now wife Samantha Power, uh, um, we were texting, not that kind of texting, but t genuine <laughs> texting, uh, from one airport to another, and. Um, uh, I liked her a lot, and she was stuck in a snowstorm. There are snowstorms elsewhere in the United States. And I was stuck in a snowstorm. And we were going back and forth, and I said, isn't this great, our chatting this way? And she said, you have to get out more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was in the government for nearly four years, and I didn't get out a whole lot. So to be out is uh, fantastic for me. I, I might just tell you, yesterday we were, uh, she's kind of busy these days at the UN, and we were um, having a, an exchange, a texting exchange. It was kind of fun. Uh, uh, it's a little like when we were first starting, and I said, isn't this great? And she responded, please don't get out more. <laughs> Okay, uh, what this topic is uh, inspired by is um, an effort to link some of Justice Brennan's uh, lifelong concerns with some of the interests of the Law and Economics program here, and actually Bob Cooter in particular. It's put much focus on the consequences of legal rules. So what, I, what I'm seeking to do is to capture in particular Justice Brennan's um, emphasis on uh, human dignity, 
human variables at stake in legal choices and to connect that with uh, an appreciation of the need to be as hard-headed as we possibly can against what is actually going to happen if we do one thing rather than another. Uh, the origin of this actually comes from a, a little discussion I had before I started in the government with a former head of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, which helps to oversee government regulation. And I asked the former head, uh, w what do you do when there's something that's tough to quantify? And the answer said, as if it was automatic, was break-even analysis. And uh, I'd never heard that word, break-even analysis. I encountered a, a great deal in government. Uh, it's something that really I think we all need to be spending a lot more time thinking about uh, because of its centrality to the operation of law and maybe ordinary life. And this is an effort to, um, uh, to see if we can make some progress. Uh, so the problem that I'm going to try to engage is sometimes the benefits of what government does uh, can't be quantified in the sense that the government lacks information that would make quantification possible. Imagine, for example, there's a regulation designed to reduce the risk of a terrorist attack where the government might not know the probability of a terrorist attack, much less the expected value of the uh, regulatory improvement. Or there might be an effort, and this is happening even as we speak, to reduce the risk of another financial meltdown where we know maybe roughly the cost of a financial meltdown of various magnitudes, but what is the contribution of the rule to reducing the risk? That might be speculative in the extreme. We might not be able to come up with a number. There might be a rule that gives people who are uh, um, using wheelchairs access to a building and to quantify the dignitary value of wheelchair access is, uh, is challenging. It might be that we have a rule, and this is not artificial, that's designed to reduce the risk of prison rape. There's a real rule involving that. Uh, how do we turn that into a monetary equivalent? Uh, stipulating what is, I know, controversial, that there's going to be an effort to do that. So that's the problem. Uh, the puzzle is the widespread use in daily life and also government practice of break-even analysis. And I'll shortly get to what that entails. The puzzle is whether we can make this adequate or good enough for government work. So there's going to be a descriptive component. I'll be saying a fair bit about what break-even analysis actually does entail, but more a normative component, an effort to say how uh, it ought to be used in regulatory practice. Okay, to bring the topic down to earth, if you're deciding whether to take a vacation in Ireland, uh, to drive to a state uh, to purchase a desirable product or to join a sport club, you might have a clear sense of the costs but only a very vague sense of the benefits. You may not know what they are. You might think to yourself, in some maybe intuitive way, what would the benefits have to be in order to justify the costs? Yes? If you have a sense of the costs of these enterprises, you might think, what would the benefits have to be in order to provide justification? This happens in business, too, where a company might know the cost of operating an apartment building is X, but it might not know how much the apartments will rent for if you decide to operate it. And you'll make some kind of quick intuitive sense, uh, make some quick intuitive judgment at least of what the benefits would have to be. Agencies typically do the same thing. When they have non-quantifiable benefits, they engage in a kind of conditional cost-benefit analysis, saying that the benefits would justify the costs if certain assumptions were met. That's the basic tool. So if you have a rule that's going to provide disclosure to consumers, for example, of uh, information involving credit cards, that's going to cost a certain amount of money to require that. What would the benefits have to be to make that justified. Now, what does this entail exactly? My principal suggestion is that break-even analysis is most helpful when what's really going on is that agencies are able to identify either a lower or upper bound for regulatory benefits. So what they're really saying, and this is what happens in ordinary life, is that a regulation costs $200 million, but it's worth going forward because the lower bound is at least $201 million. So that's the implicit intuition. 
when lower bounds are specified, we're dealing only with partial non-quantifiability, and agencies haven't been explicit about what their quantifiable judgment is. And my suggestion is they really ought to do that. Okay, if you can't specify lower or upper bounds, which is not infrequently the case, we might not have much more than a hunch or a description where if an agency says we're going forward, even though we don't know what the benefits are, we're just announcing that we're in favor of precautions, which might in multiple areas be the right thing to do if people's <coughs> lives are at risk, for example. You might not know how many, but you might favor precautions. If you're doing that and you don't have lower or upper, upper bounds, sometimes you can make progress by drawing comparisons with cases in which monetary values have previously been assigned. If you don't know, it's probably worth knowing that the federal government has valued a statistical life more accurately a mortality risk at $9 million. That's roughly the central number that agencies are using. That means, as uh, Lisa Einsterling has been very clear on, that if there's a risk of one in 100,000, it's nine, worth $90 to pay to get rid of that risk. If we know the value of a statistical life, with that we can maybe obtain some understanding of how to deal with non-quantifiable benefits. We have something on which we can anchor our, our inquiry. If we don't have that, if we don't have comparison cases, then things are more challenging. All we're doing there is explaining what information is missing and why, why some cases are really difficult. In those cases, there is a benefit of break-even analysis because it's useful in identifying assumptions under which the benefits would justify the costs, and it puts a kind of information-gathering burden on government over time to keep learning to know what the benefits are so that it can know whether the thing is justified. Just parenthetically, in my job, we didn't typically oversee the financial regulators when they are trying to reduce the risk of a financial meltdown. So the agency's use of cost-benefit analysis when they're implementing the relevant statutes, Dodd-Frank most important, has been sharply criticized by observers as not being very disciplined. The agency says this would cost X, X is pretty high. The financial meltdown cost Y, Y is astronomically high. Guess what's higher, Y or X? And the critics say, look, this rule won't with probability 100% eliminate the risk of financial meltdown. You have to do a little more work to figure it out. That's a completely fair criticism. But at least doing break-even analysis puts the agency in the position of saying, look, for this $500 million thing to be justified, it has to produce a little more than $500 million in benefits. Under what assumptions would it actually do that? And that is a useful, I think, democratic device at focusing inquiry on the crucial question, and it may be getting the agency to gather information that would permit it to give, get some sense of what is it actually achieving through its rule. Okay, here are uh, some challenges for uh, quantifiers. One claim, the kind of unifying claim, is that the benefits can't be and shouldn't be turned into monetary equivalents. Consider, for example, the dignitary benefits of protecting personal privacy on the internet or elsewhere, or of allowing people who are disabled to have access to public buildings. When we're talking about the challenge of quantification, there are three different things we might be thinking. One is regulators just can't convert the benefits into money. They might not know how much people are willing to pay or how much will they'd be willing to accept to, to give such benefits. How much would people be willing to pay to protect their privacy online? I just not know the answer to that question. A second, I think, analytically more interesting problem is regulators might think that even if they did know how much people would be willing to pay, the resulting members aren't the right basis for policy. Is the willingness of people in wheelchairs to pay the appropriate measure of whether the government should be providing them access to public buildings? That's not clear, is it? So to use the willingness to pay criterion to measure certain values is not clearly right. 
Third, regulators might want to emphasize that human goods are diverse, not unitary, that we value our things we care about in different ways, and that goods are not in any deep sense the equivalent of a stated monetary sum. These are different problems. One, we don't know how to value. The other is we might not like the figure that economics generates. And the third has to do with the diversity of goods. In his great essay on Bentham, John Stuart Mill made the point, the last point, about the diversity of goods very uh, uh, poignantly. He criticized Bentham, saying Bentham was like a one-eyed one person who, because he could only use one eye, could see better through that eye than everybody else. But he didn't have a sense of depth. That was Mill's critique of Bentham's form of utilitarianism with the unitary metric of utility. Bentham urged that this effaces qualitative differences among social goods. Mill said, not only is the moral part of man's nature in the strict sense of the term, the feeling of an approving or of an accusing conscience, something that he overlooks, he but faintly recognizes as a fact in human nature the pursuit of any other ideal end for its own sake. The sense of honor and personal dignity that feeling of personal exaltation and degradation, which acts independently of other people's opinion or even in defiance of it. The love of beauty, the passion of the artist, the love of order, of congruity, of consistency in all things, the love of power, not in the limited form of power over other human beings, but abstract power, the power of making our volitions effectual. The love of action, the thirst for mo movement and activity, a principle scarcely, scarcely of less influence in human life than its opposite, the love of, of ease. Man, that most complex being, is a very simple one in his eyes. That's his critique of Bentham. Because human beings are complex rather than simple, they value the goods at stake in regulation in qualitatively distinct ways. Of course, we make trade-offs among goods both as individuals and as public citizens and as officials, if we have that role. Of course, we make trade-offs, but without valuing them along a single metric. If a rule would protect human health, improve visibility, in decrease employment, and increase the cost of energy, and that's not a weird picture of what a rule might do, it might not make sense, it might not make deep sense to align all of those effects along a monetary scale. But that answer isn't a decisive objection to quantification and monetization if these are understood not as a Benthamite effort to capture the human reality of the goods, but as a more mundane pragmatic tool to ensure that we're in a good position to make trade-offs among various things. So if you're deciding what to do with respect to vacation time, whether to have a staycation as celebrated in Sheryl Crow's new hit, <laughs> you've heard, Easy, whether to have her song Easy, it's about staycation. <laughs> whether you're thinking about whether to have a staycation or to go to Florida or to use the money to help a friend who's in need of resources or whether just to work through and not take the vacation. There are qualitatively diverse goods, but you are making trade-offs. It's important to know, with respect to a good, whether it's worthwhile to spend $100,000, $1 a million, $5 million, or $20 million to achieve it. Whether we're explicit about the trade-offs or not, we're going to be spending a specific amount, and neither more nor less, to achieve it. Okay, that's the plea, the pragmatic plea for quantification, even taking on board Mill's critique. What quantification helps to promote is transparency, consistency, and accountability. The goal isn't to efface differences, and that should be familiar from ordinary life. Okay, in 2011, President Obama issued Executive Order 13563 a kind of mini constitution for the administrative state. And if you remember anything I'm saying today, please remember this. For the first time in the history of executive orders, a president of the United States has called out the words human dignity 
and made them part of the panoply of considerations to which agencies refer in deciding what to do. So that's new. Okay, what the order does, notwithstanding its reference to human dignity, is to require agencies to quantify anticipated benefits and costs as accurately as possible. So there's, at the same time as a recognition of the non-quantifiable, there's an insistence on quantification that actually outdoes anything President Obama's Republican predecessors had gone for. A primary goal of the insistence on quantification is to ensure that regulations are based on a fair assessment of the likely consequences, on data and evidence rather than anecdote, dogma, and intuition. And I can report that President Obama personally is deeply committed to cost-benefit and balancing and knows, cost-benefit balancing, and knows that the net benefits of regulations in his first term are actually off the charts, about $150 billion, significantly higher than the net benefits under his two predecessors. He knows it in part because he wanted it to happen and helped bring it about. Okay. Nonetheless, in areas that include financial reform, civil rights, environmental protection, and prevention of terrorism, monetary values may not be easy to generate. Let's think a little bit more deeply about my, that, why that might be so. Sometimes regulators are operating under circumstances of ignorance in the sense that they can't specify either outcomes or probabilities. That's an extreme case of non-quantifiability, but it's conceptually possible where you don't know what the bad outcomes are and you don't know what the probability that there occur there will be. That's the extreme case. Alternatively, they might be under, operating under circumstances of uncertainty rather than risk in the sense that they can identify the range of possible outcomes, but they don't know the probability that they'll occur. They might know that a certain regulation will reduce the likelihood of a terrorist attack, but they might not be able to specify the probability that it's going to occur at all, and even the likely result, if it will. They might know that a regulation is going to reduce the risk of financial catastrophe, but they might not know the extent of the contribution. In 2010, you might know this, the government identified a social cost of carbon, that is the social cost of a ton of carbon emissions, about $23 in 2010, recently updated in 2013 to a central value of about $37. There's a range, a significant range that the central value is in the middle of. No one thinks that these numbers represent the last word on the underlying questions of science and economics or ethics. It's exceptionally challenging to come up with an expected value with respect to the harms of climate change. Even when agencies can, in some sense, quantify the benefits, they might not be able to monetize them. They might know, for example, that they're going to save a bunch of endangered species members, but they might not know how to turn that into a monetary equivalent. Of course, all of these points about the challenges of quantification hold for costs as well as benefits. Sometimes costs are non-quantifiable too, but I'm going to focus on benefits as well. Okay, this has been pretty abstract so far. I'm going to try to bring it down to earth by giving you some concrete examples from actual government practice. Okay, a real rule that the Department of Transportation has been uh, pondering would reduce the risk that children are going to be killed in back over crashes. And the way it would do that is to require cameras to be put in every new car sold in the United States. So you look on the front dashboard, and you can see in back. A number of cars already has, have these. On the department's pro projection in terms of its proposal a couple of years ago, the number of lives saved would be not huge in the dozens, uh, not trivial either. The benefits of the rule on standard measures just don't justify the costs. It's a very expensive rule, in excess of a billion dollars. And the numbers of lives saved on standards assumptions just doesn't justify the cost. How is one to think about this? Well, in the proposal, the Department of Transportation said, this is a kind of complicated one. We're not just talking about ordinary lives. We're talking in 
about 45% of the cases, about children under the age of five. These are children who are unable to protect themselves, which introduces another complexity. And we're talking about children who, in a large number of the cases, are actually being killed by members of their own family, <coughs> which, if anything, is sear deserves the word searing. That is a candidate for top of the list. And the department urged that there are non-quantifiable factors having to do with the nature of the population and the nature of the risk that have to weigh in the balance. That's a real case. How do you think about those, quantifying those benefits? The department was challenged and said, I mean, it was intellectually challenged, it was challenged and just noted them without assigning dollar values. Suppose you have a rule that's designed to protect clean water. This is a stylized version of reality. It'll cost $200 million. Let's just stipulate that the benefits are ecological and don't involve human health and are tough to monetize, partly because there's no willingness to pay measure that the agency trusts and partly because uh, the actual quantity of the benefits that the water bodies are going to get is hard to uh, figure out. The agency doesn't have a clear handle on that. Does the agency is inclined to believe that the non-quantifiable benefits justify the costs? Um, but those who are interrogating the agency, both within the uh, public at large and within the sides, inside the federal government, aren't sure. How ought that to be thought about? Suppose the agency, let's call it the Department of Transportation, along with EPA, it's a real case, is imposing a new disclosure requirement on the automobile industry designed to require more clarity about the economic and environmental effects of fuel economy. Have you seen the new labels which have greater clarity about how much money you're going to save or spend if you have a fuel efficient car? That costs money, those new labels. Um, what kind of evidence does the agency have to come forward with or what kind of judgment does it have to make in order to figure out whether the expenditure is justified. The standard problem in disclosure requirements, which are pervasive in federal law, they all cost money. Governments proposed under the Affordable Care Act a rule to require calorie labeling in chain restaurants. That's expensive. How ought the agency to think about whether the benefits justify the costs? What does it have to know? Suppose, and this is a, a, a difficult one, particularly difficult one, suppose that an agency's issuing a regulation designed to reduce the incidence of prison rape. The Obama administration issued such a regulation. Uh, those who participated are proud of the achievement. The rule is likely to have significant effects in reducing the incidence of prison rape. But the cost is not small. It's hundreds of millions of dollars over the course of a year that state and local governments are going to have to incur in an economically tough time. Suppose the agency believes that the number of rapes that occur in prisons every year is roughly 200,000. How is it to think about whether that rule is justified given the fact that it could issue rules of different degrees of stringency? Okay, last case. Suppose the agency is trying to stabilize the financial system by issuing a rule that's projected to cost $300 million. Suppose the challenge made to the rule is that this is uh, a pointless rule that's going to impose costs on consumers that are unwelcome in an economically tough time. How ought an agency to consider the monetization of the benefits that would prove justificatory? Okay. These cases are different from one another, but let's just observe that the word break-even analysis by itself gives us a little bit of purchase on the cases. Some of them are pretty easy. Suppose that a rule would cost a billion dollars and that the non-quantifiable benefits would be modest in individual cases and accrued to a very small set of beneficiaries. Say by improving disclosure to them, about the potential economic savings from some technology. 
unless there's really special circumstances, it's probably sensible to conclude that the expenditure isn't worthwhile. So inside the federal government, if you have a cost-benefit requirement, let's suppose it's permitted by law, president's executive order kicks in, and the expenditure is a billion dollars, the number of beneficiaries is small. If the value of a statistical life is $9 million, it's going to be very hard to justify an expenditure of a billion to benefit a very small group. Suppose by contrast, and this is not untypical of disclosure requirements, the cost isn't that high and the benefits would accrue to a really large group. We probably are on the way toward having an intuitive sense of why break-even analysis makes it make sense, aren't we? When cases are hard, when they're between these two poles of billion dollar expenditure, modest benefit for few, much smaller expenditure, non-trivial benefit for tons. We can see, I think, why some cases are tough ones. The question is, what would the non-quantifiable benefits have to be to make up the difference? If you're thinking about the, the kid case and the back over crashes, uh, I, hope, I, I hope you are. So you can start to see, I think, what would the benefits of that rule have to be that are non-quantifiable such that the rule would be justified. Okay, here's my uh, first submission. When break-even analysis is working, and I think this is yet to be explicitly acknowledged within the federal government, there's the following degree of quantification. An agency has a sense, maybe formal, maybe intuitive, of a lower or upper bound, and that's doing the real work. So to get a little bit ahead of the story, in the prison rape case, the agency actually generated a number for a, for a rape. It's a pretty low number, $300,000 to $600,000, as I recall. The agency's sense was if you value a rape, rape prevented at that low number and then multiply it times the number of rapes plausibly prevented by the rule, then the, the, the direction they're going is clearly justified. Now, it's uneasy at best to be talking about quantification of rape. So this is, in a way, the hardest one for my, my, my thesis. Nonetheless, we're not spending an infinite amount of money to prevent rape in prison. There has to be some implicit understanding of at what, at what point the cost is just too much to bear. And something like this seemed to be going on in the Justice Department's analysis. Okay, if we think that a lower monetary bound in terms of prevention of something bad is, say, 300 million or 300,000, then we might multiply at times the number of things there are that are bad, and we're well on the way of trying to figure out what to do with the rule. When an agency says that a rule does not survive break-even analysis, what it must be saying on this approach is that the benefits have a ceiling. The upper bound of the benefit is insufficiently high to justify the rule. So that, my first suggestion, that's what's going on in the easy cases. There's a sense of a upper bound or a lower bound, and that's itself the motor which ends up driving the agency's decision. Of course it's the case that in some cases a point estimate you can't come up with you don't know how many of X bad things you're going to prevent. You don't know the cost of each. But you can describe lower and upper ranges and maybe specify an expected value once you're equipped with them. So agencies not infrequently, it might be an air pollution rule, think that the range of benefits is from here to here. Often it's pretty wide. But the agency knows what the lower bound and upper bound is, and it might be able to calculate an expected value that works just the same way a lower and upper bound would do if we had um, the benefit of a point estimate. Okay, I'm going to now get, try to get a, a little more uh, nuanced, if I may, and to try to explain a little bit that sometimes you can have quantification without monetization. Forgive me, this is a little technical. And sometimes you can have monetization without quantification. And I hope they're both going to turn out to be more interesting than this start suggests. OK, an agency might be able to quantify the benefits, meaning it knows how many units of good it's going to get. But it might not be able to turn them into monetary equivalents. 
It might know if it does something involving security airports, it's going to increase privacy. Or if it does something involving protection of people who are disabled, it's going to protect a certain number of people. It might know that it's going to protect a number of water bodies. But it might not know how to turn them into monetary equivalents in any of those cases. Even in such cases, you get the quantities, but you don't have the monetization. You can, I think, make progress if you know what the lower bound on the monetary equivalents are. So you might know that for a disabled person to be able to get in a, into a building, is it worth at least x? And then if you multiply the number of disabled people times x, you're in business at generating the lower bound. You with me? You might know that you have this many numbers of water bodies that are getting improved. You might know the most that protecting that water body can be worth is y, because nobody's health is at risk, let's suppose. Then if the rule's going to cost a billion dollars, it's going to be very hard to justify. So where you have quantification possible with monetization not possible, still you might be able to be in business through this route. You can also have monetization without quantification. It's a little more subtle. Sometimes you might be able to monetize a benefit, but you know, might not know many, how many units you're going to get. So you might know that every consumer is going to save $400 if you do X. But you might not know how many consumers there are who are going to get that money. That's not inconceivable by any means. The agency still might be able to specify lower or upper bounds with respect to the number of units. An agency might know that the regulation is going to produce at least 10,000 benefit units, or at most 5,000. And then we're in business. And if this is seeming a little esoteric and a little crazy, and why did I come to this talk? Maybe I should back up just to, to, to give you a little animating theory here. Um, across the way, the Oakland Athletics are still run by Billy Bean, yes, who made famous with Michael Lewis, his uh, writer, the idea of Moneyball. And the idea was to replace intuitions and anecdotes with hard numbers. Get some statistical analysis going in baseball. And that's the performance measure. So what you're seeing in that esoteric stuff I just talked about is an effort to do a form of regulatory money ball in an area where it's least promising. That is to try to be as numerical and hard-headed as we possibly can in order to know what to do in a period of scarce resources where we're not going to be devoting infinite money to X or Y or Z because we don't have that. OK, my suggestion is this lower and upper bound stuff gives us a great purchase on a number of the seemingly intractable questions. But sometimes we don't know what the upper bound or lower bound is. My suggestion is when we don't, then we can consult government practice to see what comparison figures we have and build on them. The Environmental Protection Agency, this is just a fact, values a non-fatal heart attack at between $100,000 and $200,000. If that seems shockingly low, then maybe it should be higher. I'm just specifying the number. Cardiovascular problems at $42,000, and an emergency visit for asthma at $430. And the technical people generate numbers of this sort. There's a range of numbers. The agency might not know how to value the protection of human dignity through wheelchair accessibility, but it might be able to have comparison figures from other areas in a way that can similarly generate lower and upper bounds. If X, where X isn't that big a deal, is valued at least $100,000, then maybe the ability of someone to be free from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation which is a pretty big deal, is worth at least that. Yes? So we might not have a good value for privacy rights or anti-discrimination <clears throat> rights. But we might be able to build on comparison cases where we do have good values and to reach a judgment that the non-monetized value has to be worth at least that. 
Okay, so the structure of the argument is lower and upper bounds, comparison cases, third and finally. The hardest cases arise when agencies can't produce floors or ceilings or expected values, where they can't quantify or monetize, and where they don't have comparisons. What are they doing then? Now this is a real challenge, and it's emphatically a legal challenge. There are a bunch of cases growing in number. It's not quite a bunch yet. That's a good thing, I think. But there are cases growing in number in which agencies are losing in court on cost-benefit grounds, often because they're not monetizing enough. But for an agency that's trying to figure out how to implement Dodd-Frank or what to do about certain environmental statutes, the challenge of monetization is, is, is really formidable, not because they're not doing their job, but because they don't know what the numbers are. Consider a water pollution regulation that would cost $400 million while producing ecological benefits that the agency can't quantify or turn into monetary equivalents. Okay, what's going on there? I think all we have is conditional justification. That is, all the agency can do is to say, if the benefits are this, then we go forward. And then its judgment is um, not a whole lot more than uh, a hunch or a, let's call it an informed judgment. In the most extreme version of a skeptical view here, agencies might as well flip a coin, at least until they acquire additional information. Maybe break-even analysis draws attention to the need to acquire new information, but the skeptical view suggests in its absence, the analysis can't offer a lot of help. I hope you're with me on this. These are the most poignant cases. They're not unrealistic, where the agency can't come up with upper and lower bounds. It doesn't have comparison cases. It's just got a problem whose magnitude it can't specify, and it's got costs on the other side. Is break-even analysis helpful there? I'm not sure, but if it is, here's the best explanation. And I hope, if this is uh, intelligible at all, the next weeks you'll encounter, not in a poignant setting, but maybe in a setting that involves life, what to do, something that's not so unlike this. Sometimes the agency doesn't know enough to know whether action or inaction is justified because it doesn't have information. Everyone agrees agencies should try to acquire that information, but they don't, if they don't have it, the best that they can do is be candid. What break-even analysis does, and this is no small virtue, is to help them to specify the source of uncertainty and tell the American public what they'd need to know in order to reduce it. Conditional justifications of this kind, think of children at risk from back over crashes, or of polluted water bodies, or of discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Conditional justifications have the advantage of transparency, because whether the agency goes forward or not, or goes forward aggressively or not, at least it's specifying the factual assumptions that would have to hold in order for the benefits to justify the costs. And note we're having a million rather than benthamite conception of both benefits and costs, not pretending that they can be all aligned along a metric called dollars. That specification of what would have to be true in order for the thing to be justified is in its way not, a conf not merely a confession of ignorance, but also a tribute to democratic self-government because it ensures accountability promoting public consideration of the plausibility of the assumptions that justify acting or not, and also because it puts a premium on testing and revisiting the judgments over time as new information becomes available. It's a way of saying that the regulatory system is still kind of young. We're learning immensely every few years about stuff, about consequences. And if break-even analysis involves a kind of confession that it's not merely an embarrassment, it's also a plea for learning. 
Okay, the great advantage of quantitative cost-benefit analysis, if there is one, is that it focuses attention on the likely consequences of regulation, helping to reduce the risk that judgments will come from dogmas, impressions, self-interested private groups, or intuitions. That's the promise, that's the hope. It's one reason President Obama's committed to it. The problem on which I'm trying to make some progress here is that agencies have to deal with values that can't be quantified, and they have to resort to break-even analysis, a plausible approach when they can produce upper and lower bounds, point estimates or expected values. When they can't do that, I've suggested they can enlist comparisons, above all by reference to cases in which monetary values have previously been assigned. If we know the value of a statistical life is $9 million, then we might not know that something that clearly falls short of that can't be valued at that, and that something that is like dozens of that has to be valued correspondingly. When useful comparisons aren't possible, break-even analysis isn't a whole lot more than a conclusion or a hunch, but that's far from useless because it promotes transparency and allows scrutiny of the assumptions on which the government's judgments are based. Okay, my emphasis has been on non-quantifiable values and regulatory policies, but I hope you can see I have a bigger fish even in mind. Uh, those values play a role in lots of domains, not just regulatory policy. Precious and large as that area seems to yours truly. Governments have to consider break-even analysis and non-quantifiability in making decisions about foreign policy, budgets, enforcement activity, and lots more. Entrepreneurs often have to ask without precise information about how to quantify or monetize important variables. Lawyers deciding whether to bring a case, take a client, stretch themselves or not, are engaged in break-even analysis every week. In ordinary life, all of us have to make decisions about how to trade off an assortment of values, some of which defy quantification, partly for Mill's reason, but partly for the other reason, which is we just don't know either quantities or how to translate into something that we can handle. In all of these contexts, some form of break-even analysis is likely to be at work, and uses of upper and lower bounds are common, even if it's just implicit. For those reasons, break-even analysis is hardly limited to the regulatory context. It's a criti critical aspect of practical reason reasoning in multiple areas of human life. Thanks. Okay. Hi, despite what Bob Cooter told you, I'm not Dan Farber, I'm Ricky Rivez. Uh, we're actually using a different order. Uh, but I'm delighted to be here and, and very grateful to Tom Jordan and to the Brennan Center for having invited me to um, comment on a paper that I like very, very much. So in non-quantifiable, Professor Sunstein makes a persuasive argument that administrative agencies should engage in break-even analysis when they're not able to quantify or monetize some or all of the benefits of a particular regulation. Break-even analysis adds useful structure to regulatory decisions that otherwise would appear to be manipulable and arbitrary. So think about this simple example. If the quantified yearly benefits of a possible environmental regulation are $4 billion and they result from reduced mortality, the regulation costs $5 billion, but in addition to reduced mortality, it also has benefits in terms of reduced morbidity, but those benefits can't be quantified. How is the agency going to figure out what to do? Now, if the agency just says without any other structure that it believes that the value of reduced morbidity must be over a $1 billion, its decision will seem arbitrary. And if it says the opposite, its decision will also seem arbitrary. So there's no, this isn't the one-way ratchet. But suppose instead that the agency can determine that 100,000 people throughout the country 
will each lose an average of two days of work and suffer moderate discomfort. Then the situation would look quite different. The regulation would be justified as long as the agency values a day of um, lost work at more than $50. And if the agency chooses to do that, that probably would seem to most of us a reasonable decision, given the fact that uh, the wage, the minimum wage uh, for a day of work is, is, is significantly higher than $50. So presumably, these workers are adding that, uh, that amount of value. Now, also, um, break-even analysis can promote consistency across different regulatory decisions. If in one case an agency decides uh, to undergo, undertake a regulation uh, because it believes that a day uh, of lost work should be valued at least at $200, and now it's considering a different regulation in which the regulation would be justifiable if uh, a day of lost work was valued at least $150, if having done the first regulation, the agency decides not to do the second one, its decision will be arbitrary. So break-even analysis is a good thing uh, for the reasons that Professor Sunstein uh, discusses so elegantly. But it is not a panacea. It's at best a second best alternative to the actual valuations. If we could do the valuations, we wouldn't be in this business in the first place. So instead of speculating whether it's reasonable uh, to value a day of lost work at the break-even amount, it would be preferable to actually perform the valuation. And as, at most, as Professor Sunstein recognizes, break-even analysis gives us an upper and lower bound. And sometimes that's helpful, and sometimes it's less helpful. Um, so, for example, if a safety regulation is justifiable only if the value of a loss of limb is at least $10 million, we can safely conclude the regulation would not pass a cost-benefit test since the value of statistical life is around $9 million. And, you know, as bad as these things are, it's better to lose a limb than to lose a life. Now, assume hypothetically that we have valued the loss of a finger at $50,000. We could then say with confidence that a loss of a limb should be valued more than the loss of a finger. So now we have two numbers. Uh, we have a range. So basically, we have a $50,000 to a $9 million range in my example. And break-even analysis helped us that far. Uh, evaluation for the loss of a limb of less than $50,000 would be, would be arbitrary, as would evaluation of more than $9 million. But within the range, it doesn't help us. And in this case, I mean, obviously contrived example, the range happens to be big. Now, there's a second and perhaps conceptually more serious limitation to break-even analysis, which is that it works better where the regulation produces one unquantifiable benefit. But many regulations have multiple unquantifiable benefits. So then it's harder to tell. Um, think of an example involving the loss of a limb that we just discussed, and consider a situation in which the regulation also reduces the incidence of asthma in a larger proportion of the population. If $10 million per lost limb is too high a break-even valuation to justify the regulation, when that is the only non-quantifiable benefit, does it become reasonable, a reasonable break-even valuation for a lost limb plus a decrease in the, in the incidence of asthma among multiple people? It's hard to tell. Um, now, obviously, for those of you who um, are statistically minded, we could do sort of a multiple regression analysis and perhaps try to tease out these values. But we need to have a lot more information in order to do that. Now, so, so far, I've agreed with Professor Sunstein this is a very valuable uh, endeavor. I uh, agree with um, his very intelligent approach to perform uh, break-even analysis. And I think we probably would agree uh, on the fact that this is, uh, at best, the second best, um, uh, a second best methodology. So what I'm going to do in this comment is I'm actually not going to take issue with um, anything he says, because essentially I agree with, uh, with, with all of it, or almost all of it. But instead, I want to discuss three issues that are um, intertwined with his piece. So the first is actually to underscore its importance. And the reason that this piece is so important uh, is because in the absence of some structure of the sort that break-even analysis provides, uh, benefits, and this, to a large extent environmental benefits, would end up getting um, 
disregarded or under, um, um, undervalued by the agencies and by the courts. And I'll give you some examples of that. So, um, so by doing this, we're more likely um, to end up with regulations that take those benefits at least somewhat more seriously. The second point is benefits don't come in dichotomous categories. They're either quantifiable or unquantifiable. These categories are um, shift and shift with time. So I'll give five examples of benefits that have, during various uh, points, been considered non-quantifiable. Some are still considered that. But uh, have either, over time, been moved into the quantifiable category in the process of moving there. And, and, and that point is, is actually an important one, and that connects to the third point, that how a benefit moves from the um, unquantifiable category to, to the quantifiable category is not random. And government, um, just like you can expend uh, resources in, in coming up with methodologies for dealing with um, unquantifiable benefits, can also expend resources in accelerating the quantification of benefits. And um, government has done that over time. I'll give a couple of examples. Um, and here there's some reason to worry, because as, um, as those of you who follow these issues know, uh, social science research is not uh, a favorite activity um, among uh, federal funders these days. So first, um, so on the first point, uh, the importance. There are, it's not hard to find cases showing judicial skepticism of non-quantified benefits. When I teach environmental law, uh, a case I spend a little time on because, um, uh, in part because I think the court got it wrong, but in part because it's an example of incredibly um, intrusive judicial review of a cost-benefit analysis, although of, an er of, of a very early one, is a case called Corrosion Proof Fittings versus EPA, which deals um, with the banning of asbestos. Um, so this is a case in which the agency actually quantified certain benefits, and asbestos is a carcinogen. Uh, the main benefit of banning asbestos is um, saving lives. Um, uh, this was in the very early days uh, of valuing lives. And the agency, for reasons that actually are not completely clear to me, never were, uh, decided to value the lives that would be lost before the year 2000, but then to treat subsequent uh, saved lives as a non-quantifiable benefit. And in a sense, um, what the court should have said is, look, you don't have a very good reason for not having quantified this benefit. Just go back and quantify it. I mean, that would have been actually a good thing. It also underscores this idea that benefits don't come in uh, quantifiable and non-quantifiable categories, and these categories are somewhat permeable. Instead, essentially, uh, the court um, ended up disregarding the benefit. I mean, there were other problems with the cost-benefit analysis. There were other problems with judicial opinion. Uh, but this is an example of the risk that an agency takes if it's not going to quantify uh, a benefit. Uh, there are other cases um, where uh, the agency actually doesn't want to undertake the regulation. There is an unquantifiable benefit. The agency doesn't attach much value to it. Uh, but some challenger argues that that non-quantifiable benefit should have, been, should have gotten more scrutiny. And there are many cases in which the courts then defer to the agency uh, and the uh, non-quantifiable benefit is essentially being treated as non-existent. Every once in a while, the courts have actually done the opposite. And the most celebrated case, and certainly celebrated um, over in this part of the country, um, is the is Center for Biological Diversity versus NHTSA, is the case uh, involving uh, fuel economy standards for light trucks. So this was a case in which the non-quantifiable benefit um, was uh, the reduction in greenhouse gases. And the Bush administration, citing the great uncertainty in uh, what, um, how the reduction of greenhouse gases should be valued, assigned the value of zero. In the Ninth Circuit, um, Judge Betty Fletcher, um, said that um, the uncertainty was there, uh, but that zero couldn't possibly be the best estimate of uh, what the benefit of greenhouse gas reductions were, sent the case back to the agency. The agency then proceeded. I mean, th this is one of the cases that provided some impetus for the quantification of the social cost of carbon. And eventually, um, the agency did actually come up with a number, uh, came up with new regulations which were, which were upheld. 
So in the absence of um, some technique, I mean, quantification as the first best technique and break-even analysis as the second best technique, it is likely that environmental benefits would be, um, uh, would be undervalued or ignored in many cases. And, and you shouldn't think of the NHTSA case as a great victory because that might just be the tip of the iceberg. That's the one case where we know the court actually forced the agency to do it. There are many cases, uh, some of which I mentioned, where the court uh, didn't, and there are many which we just don't know about because uh, the agency's decision wasn't challenged. Now, what about the claim, my claim, that these categories um, are permeable? Um, and I have five examples, and I hope I remember them all, because otherwise I'll never be able to run for president, um, <laughs> which I actually couldn't do anyway because I wasn't born in the United States. So uh, this is a safe one. Uh, there's no cost to this one. So, um, so first, the value of statistical life. Uh, for those of us uh, who um, uh, work in this area, the value of statistical life is probably the single most important number uh, ever devised, because the biggest benefit of federal environmental regulation um, is not the protection of ecosystems, but is the saving of human lives. And at $9 million a life, uh, with some of these regulations saving thousands, in some cases tens of thousands of lives per year, the benefits are very large. So this is an important number. But this number wasn't always there. In fact, there was a time, I mean, we can go back 50 years, uh, when saved lives were essentially treated as a non-quantifiable uh, value and were undervalued for the reasons that I mentioned. Uh, there was another time, not quite so long ago, maybe like 40 years ago or so, where agencies used a different approach, a human capital approach, that basically valued lives uh, by reference to lost wages. So you were basically what you earned. And if you weren't working in the marketplace, I guess your life wasn't worth very much. Um, now, all of the components of life that are independent of our ability to produce resources in the marketplace were treated as non-quantifiable and ignored. And that was the system we were in. Uh, until at some point, um, not so long ago, really, it was really in the 80s uh, that this became the bread and butter of regulatory practice. Second category, the social cost of carbon. Uh, Cass mentioned it, I mentioned it as well in connection with the NHTSA case. Uh, until the Obama administration set up uh, an interagency group in, in, in um, 2009, led by Michael Greenstone, a very distinguished uh, economics professor at MIT, who was then the chief economist to the Council of Economic Advisors, um, the government had not quantified the benefits of greenhouse gas reductions. This group came up with a number. Judge Fletcher was right. Zero was not the best estimate. It turned out the best estimate was $23 uh, per ton of uh, carbon dioxide reduction. And now the best estimate is $37 because a more recent group uh, redid that number. So that's also a success story, a more recent effort, a successful effort at quantification. There are others. Ecosystem services. Um, ecosystems provide services that should be amenable to quantification. Uh, by protecting wetlands, uh, we protect against floods. Uh, there's a lot of discussion sort of post sand in New York City about whether New York City would have done better if it had had uh, a lar larger areas covered by wetlands. How do we quantify these things? Um, actually, the government has shown some interest in this area. There are some NRC reports, uh, reports of the National Research Council. Uh, there are some EPA reports. But we're not really doing this systematically uh, at this point. Could we? Sure. Do I think we will in a decade or two? I think we will. Fourth category, fear, anxiety, and stress. This is something that Professor Sunstein has written about as well. It's clearly important. Um, the fear that comes from exposure to carcinogens is a significant issue. So if you're exposed to a carcinogen because of the long latency periods uh, of cancer, you might not know for 30 years whether you get cancer or not. You might worry about it in the meantime. I can tell you that because my wife uh, grew up in a house built on uranium tailings in southwestern Colorado. We worry about that. Um, how much should that be valued at? Um, if you think this is a crazy thing to value, I can tell you EPA uh, produced a white paper urging the quantification, but we haven't made much progress there. And last category, and, and, and I mention this because my co-author, Mike Livermore, with whom I wrote this cost-benefit book, just wrote an article about this, which I think is terrific is the real option values of involved in federal government decisions about leasing um, 
for oil drilling on the outer continental shelf. So the federal government basically treats this as a dichotomous decision. Do we drill now or do we never drill? And if um, the value of the resource uh, minus the environmental costs and cost of extraction um, are, are greater than zero, then drilling is a good thing. But maybe there is a third option, and the third option is waiting. Why would we wait? Well, we might learn something. I mean, first, uh, oil prices fluctuate over time, and variance creates an option value. And second, we might learn something about the environmental damages. Um, we're actually litigating, mean, I run a little public policy institute at the law school, is actually litigating uh, a decision um, under the Outer Continental Shelf Act for the failure to take account of, of option values. This is actually a really strange one, because given how well understood option values are in financial markets, and given the fact that conceptually we're talking about exactly the same thing, it's something uh, that we should have been doing, and it's an area in which the government has done very little, has done much less than on ecosystem services or even on fear, anxiety, and stress. Um, last thing before I get kicked out for uh, overstaying my welcome. Um, the government plays a role in this. So what, how things move from the unquantifiable category to the quantifiable category depends to some extent on the expenditure of government resources. So for example, in the value of statistical life, many of the studies uh, that produced um, uh, the first sort of serious consensus around the value of statistical life, which was uh, done by EPA in the 1990s, uh, I was on the peer review group as part of the EPA Science Advisory Board then. Many of those studies were funded by the federal government, by EPA, by the National Science Foundation, by other federal agencies. The social cost of carbon, that came about because of sustained direct effort uh, by a high-level interagency group within the federal government. Um, otherwise, it might have taken longer. So. Now, you might ask, what is the optimal federal expenditure uh, in this? And that would be uh, an interesting question, which I, I don't have any, anything to say about. Um, but here I worry, because basically, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, social science research is embattling Congress. I mean, the sequester has affected this. It has affected other federal expenditures. And uh, there have been efforts by the Republican House leadership um, to cut significantly spending on social science research. There have been other efforts that have been actually embedded, embodied in uh, appropriations riders uh, to require findings of social science research as a national interest and so on. So we seem to be moving in the, in the wrong direction. Um, the fact that we're moving in the wrong direction makes Professor Sunstein's uh, project more, more important. Uh, but nonetheless, but the only thing I worry about is that too much attention to how to deal with unquantifiable benefits is going to detract from the attention that we could give to moving benefits from the unquantifiable to the quantifiable category, which is the first best approach rather than the second best approach. Thank you so much. I guess my reputation precedes me. Uh, so those of you who weren't familiar with uh, uh, Cass Sunstein's work, I think will now have a better sense of uh, why he's been such an enormously influential scholar. Uh, um, one thing that you'll also see as this session continues, at least those of you who hold out uh, for the rest of the session, which I, I, I you know, it's okay to leave and come back, but you really should hear Lisa's uh, <laughs> presentation at the end. It'll be worth the wait. Uh, but one thing you'll notice is that we have a sort of range of views about cost-benefit analysis, and either by chance or design, it corresponds somewhat to the order of common uh, commentators. Uh, so uh, 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 Ricky Rivez, like uh, uh, Sunstein, is a very strong backer of cost-benefit analysis as really the ideal way uh, to make regulatory decisions. I think it's a useful tool, but not quite as uh, uh, not quite as useful or appropriate for all occasions. And then you'll hear from Lisa, I think, about her views. Um, and we all so one temptation here is to just sort of 
pull our uh, old debates out of the closet and talk about how this exactly proves that what I thought about cost-benefit analysis is right all along. Uh, I'm trying, I, I want to resist that temptation because uh, I think um, it, it would have sort of limited uh, interest. Um, and instead, I want to sort of take for granted both the role of OIRA as an institution uh, and uh, the general utility of cost-benefit analysis. Uh, and I want to focus on these hard cases uh, um, and um, uh, take a look at break-even analysis as a way of dealing with the hard cases. One way of looking at OIRA uh, is that it is a regulator of regulators. That is, it's a regulatory agency that issues guidance, rules, approvals for the actions of agencies like EPA, which in turn regulate the, the world at large. And so when we talk about break-even analysis as a preferred approach, that's a bit like EPA uh, preferring, say, the use of scrubbers as a way to deal with a pollutant. Now, we know sometimes that can be very effective as a way of achieving results. But we also know there are some potential problems uh, that it may require more uniformity uh, in cases where more individual variation would be useful, uh, that it may result in a technology becoming sort of locked in, even though maybe the science and engineering basis is changing over time. It's hard, to, hard for uh, OMB to change the rules that govern cost-benefit analysis, just as it's hard for EPA to change the rules governing uh, pollution. Um, and it may be that the regulator, in this case OIRA, has less information in some ways than the people it's regulating, uh, and that can be a cause of difficulty, too. So thinking of this as a kind of regulation, I want to ask two questions about it of the kind that OIRA would ask an agency. Uh, about the agency's own, reg uh, own um, regulations. Uh, number one, what are the potential problems with the use of this technology, this decision technology of, of break-even analysis, uh, in terms of sort of what it will cost potentially in the way of side effects or in how effective it will or will not be in practice? And then other, uh, also, you'd want to ask, well, what alternatives did you consider? Um, and uh, so I think all of this is really in a spirit of saying that I think there are more issues that, that can be discussed usefully here. Um, I'm, um, uh, this may be a comment that it ends up being self-defeating because the final form of the paper will discuss all this and I'll have nothing to say. Uh, or at least explain why these are foolish concerns. Uh, so let me start with the pitfalls uh, that we might get into in actually applying break-even analysis. Uh, I think it's really important throughout to distinguish between these two situations. One, where we sort of don't know what's going to happen in the world. We don't know how many lives will be saved. We may not know just what's going to happen with climate change. And the other is where what, what we're not sure about is how to think about the values at stake. Um, so let me start with the uncertainties issues and what are the pitfalls here. And I think the basic, to the extent that there, I, I think break-even analysis has a lot of intuitive appeal. Um, I, I think, I know that I have used it in thinking about some problems and without knowing the name. Um, but I think it also has some risks, uh, partly because it is so commonsensical and intuitive. And one of the risks is that it will make us think we've done a much better analytic job than we've really done. Um, in particular, with uncertainties, I'm worried about the bookends. I'm worried about the agency's decision about what the low end and the high end of, of the probabilities is. And one of the reasons that I'm worried about that uh, um, is that we have a lot of experience with agencies really getting that wrong, right? So agencies thinking that there was no possibility that anyone would ever, you know, the, the probability of a terrorist attack costing a billion dollars was nil, that there was no possibility of somebody stealing an airplane and running it into a building. Uh, the um, cost, the uh, uh, environmental disclosures for the BP oil spill uh, gave something like a thousand gal um, barrel spill as being the worst case scenario, right? Uh, and anything below that was too improbable to discuss. I think this kind of mistake is maybe especially likely in cases where 
There is a small probability but very catastrophic outcome. Uh, it's easy for the agency to focus on the probability without taking into account the catastrophic part of it. There may also well be cases where the opposite mistake is made and the, and the, the agency thinks that something is, is um, you know, they, get, they become terrified by some outcome um, without really focusing uh, hard enough on the probabilities. So I, I don't want to assume that those mistakes are all in the right direction or on the same direction, but I think that there may be a kind of uh, tendency to anchor on these numbers. Um, and there are a number of reasons why that could go wrong, and almost all of them have been written by, you know, I, I thought about making all of my footnotes in this article to Sunstein, <laughs> because he has written about so many different aspects of these problems that you, you really don't have to read anything else. Uh, even if you disagree with them, everything is there that you need to know. Uh, so, uh, so there are a lot of reasons. People are, agency heads like other people make cognitive errors. Agencies engage in groupthink. Uh, and um, they may have an optimism bias. And that may apply not only to the line agencies like EPA, but it may apply to OIRA as well. Uh, particularly since OIRA spends a lot of its time reining in any agencies, there may be a sort of culture of, of assuming that agencies are probably exaggerating. Um, I, but I don't know from the outs I mean, I know nothing from the inside of the agency, but it would not be implausible, just as you might think that EPA overestimates um, risks in some case because that's their, their role. So I worry that these numbers will give us the sense that the agency has really considered the range of risks and that we've taken care of the uncertainty. And, you know, it's, it's just cosmetic. Uh, uh, now, um, a second uh, area is the one of unquantified values. And here, too, I think we have to be careful uh, because uh, it's easy to say something that's superficially plausible. Uh, but yet um, uh, possibly not be uh, really dealing with the problem. Um, and um, I, I wanted to take the uh, examples. Um, it, it sounds enormously plausible um, um, when um, uh, we hear that, of course, uh, the life of a sea otter or a prison rape should be valued at less than uh, $9 million because that's the value of human life. And that may well be right. But I think it, when you think about it, it's actually not quite so clear that that should be true. And the reason is that we're, let's start with the sea otter case. To some extent, we're comparing, uh, how was I going to put this, um, um, uh, human apples with uh, sea otter abalone uh, rather than oranges. Um, and the reason is that we're really engaging in two very different exercises. When we do the value of statistical life, what we're trying to do, at least, uh, people disagree about how, how certain we are about those figures. What we're trying to do is ask something like, how much do workers have to be paid to take on an extra one in a thousand risk of death? That is, if, if, if they move from one occupation to another one that's a little bit riskier, what's going to happen to wages, right? Now, and there are disputes about these studies and how well they're done, but, I, but that's what we're trying to do. Now, that is absolutely... One of the few things I, I think I can say that with real clarity uh, and certainty is that that is not what we're doing with sea otters, right? We are not asking how much you have to pay a sea otter to take on an additional risk. Uh, uh, even if we translated that to extra abalone, I think we still wouldn't really care, right? We're trying to do some things that are entirely different. We're, we may think sea otters perform services that are useful to the ecology, uh, we may think that they're just cute and adorable. We may think they have an inherent right to life. But whatever it is that we're doing there, it's very different. And so it's not necessarily true that performing one kind of exercise with human beings will, will give you a, a number that's easily lined up with the number for uh, a very different kind of exercise with sea otters. Now, I strongly suspect that after you got done thinking about all those factors, you would still think $9 million was too much to save a sea otter. Um, on the other hand, I'm much less sure that it's too much to save a whale. Uh, and uh, because uh, they're rarer, there are more ecological benefits and so forth. But I'm also a little worried that the intuition is skewed a little bit just because sea otters are a lot smaller than we are and whales are a lot bigger. 
and that in this very childish way we're kind of translating, you know, we might translate that into value without even thinking. So I'm worried about the sort of temptations to make these kinds of mistakes. Um, I think that there are um, uh, similar problems uh, with trying to think about prison rape, although I, I again think spending $9 million for rape saved was probably more than we would think was reasonable. But again, I'm not, I'm not, I have no idea how you would compare, say, uh, the value of preventing a rape in prison versus a non-fatal heart attack. Uh, and one concern I might have would be that the um, uh, uh, middle-aged uh, men who staff much of the government uh, might think that the heart attack was really a much more serious problem. Uh, <laughs> Uh, completely unwittingly. Uh, so, I, so I think there are these issues. That maybe they're just unavoidable, and no matter how we make the decisions, people are, infall are, are fallible, right? So, um, but at least I think I would like to have, I think that you'd have to look really hard at the various cases that are assembled very usefully in the paper to try to figure out whether, that, whether things were kind of working right or whether we were ending up with, with the sort of weaknesses of the technique coming out. Now, the other thing we might want to look at is alternatives. Um, and I want to try to make sure I don't run over. I guess I have enough five minutes to talk about alternatives. Thank you. Uh, I got new glasses so I can read that sign. Um, so I think we could consider really two different kinds of alternatives. On the one hand, we could consider going even more quantitative in some ways and even more formalized and hopefully rigorous in dealing with some of these problems. Uh, um, for example, in dealing with uncertainties about uh, the extent of risks, about how probable they are, uh, economists and decision theorists have, have worked on a number of different techniques that, try, that go beyond just sort of thinking about the, the bookends um, and deciding if they're, if they're both on one side or the other of the break-even point. Uh, we could think about trying to use some of those techniques. They may not be ready for prime time, or they might be. Uh, we could, uh, instead of uh, asking the agency to sort of give its judgment about these things, uh, we could uh, use uh, what's called expert elicitation and try to do a more rigorous uh, job of getting those kinds of upper and lower ends from a larger cross-section of experts. In terms of valuation, instead of having the agency decide whether it thinks something is bigger or lower than a certain number or comparable, Again, we could take the same evidence that the agency has boiled down, and we could do what are called revealed preference studies and go out and ask people and try to get the view in a sort of more rigorous way of what, in general, people think about how much it's reasonable to spend on sea otters given that the value of human life saved is $9 million. And since there's no real reason to think that bureaucrats are better at making these value judgments than anybody else, we might be better off trying to do it that way. Now, on the other hand, we could go less quantitative. Um, and there are a couple reasons why this might be a good idea. One of them is that in a number of important cases, uh, cost-benefit analysis legally can't be the basis of the decision uh, because Congress, for better or worse, has prescribed something different. And in those cases, cost-benefit analysis is a disclosure requirement. And the question is, what does it take to have effective disclosures? Uh, and that, I guess, is partly an empirical question. We might do a study to see what best informs people. Uh, but we could also look at other disclosure regimes. Uh, for example, uh, we could ask uh, when companies have uh, risks, uh, risks that are hard to quantify, but potentially serious, what does the SEC require them to say? Um, and as far as I can tell, the SEC does not require the company to do the analysis to tell you, if you think the probability is over X percent, don't buy the stock. Uh, we think it's enough to tell people sort of the facts and let them make their own judgment about which way to go. So maybe that's an argument for doing something similar here. Um, and then finally, um, there's the possibility that in the cases where things are really hard to quantify, we might consider those to be really political decisions. Um, uh, either something that the president should decide. Now, this president is in favor, you know, is, embraces cost-benefit analysis, but not all presidents do. I think uh, his predecessor was more of an economic libertarian than a believer in cost-benefit analysis. A future president may be 
believer in environmental uh, precaution. Whatever they are, it's what people voted for. They knew the general attitude that was being taken into office. Maybe that's enough. Or we might look at what Congress said. Uh, for example, in the prison rape case, uh, when you look at the statute, I left my paper over there, uh, but Congress talks about uh, a zero tolerance policy for prison rape. Uh, it talks about the prevention of prison rape as a high priority. Uh, now, this doesn't, and, and it says something about cost, which is basically that it should be compared with the, the overall cost of, of the prisons. Now, that may not preclude cost-benefit analysis in cases where we're able to confidently do a cost-benefit analysis. I'm not going to address that. But it may be in the cases where we can't that we ought to say, well, it's not really open to us to say prison rape is not a really serious problem because that's why Congress passed the statute. And they told us they think it's a really serious problem. And therefore, at, in, at least as a tiebreaker in cases where we don't know anything to the contrary, we should go along with, with Congress. And let, if, people, if the public doesn't like that, the public can vote the other way. Um, now, I'm not necessarily endorsing, these are obviously somewhat inconsistent alternatives. And I'm not endorsing any of them. I suspect that if we really thought hard about it, we might find break-even analysis is a good tool a lot of the time, that sometimes we should go more to the tech side, be more quantitative, other times maybe in the opposite direction. Um, all I'm doing at this point is saying that I think that these are issues that, that uh, before we decide just how firmly to embrace this decision-making technology, uh, we need to make a real effort to think through. Thank you. Thanks so much to the Brennan Center for having me here and to Tom Jordy. It's a special privilege to be here. Professor Sunstein was my teacher and Justice Brennan was my boss. And so it's especially nice uh, to, to be able to comment tonight. Um, one of the great challenges posed by using cost-benefit analysis to evaluate regulatory policies is that so often so many regulatory consequences either cannot be quantified or cannot be monetized or both. And usually, not always, but usually it's the benefits that can't be quantified or monetized. And this means that if you require the benefits to be bigger than the costs in quantified terms before a policy may go forward through um, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, that many policies will get stuck due to the lack of quantification. And indeed, in his great book, Simpler, as Sunstein points out, that if a rule had quantified costs that were bigger than the quantified benefits, that rule was much more likely to get into trouble and may well uh, get stuck and, and not be issued. So it's a problem. It's largely a one-way problem. It will tilt against the government acting in, uh, in particular um, cases. And so I want to first applaud Professor Sunstein for taking this problem on. It has long been one of the um, most sustained critiques offered by people who are not huge fans of cost benefit. So I applaud him for taking it on and also for trying to offer uh, a way out of, uh, out of this dilemma. I'm going to do something. I hope this is all right. I'm going to do. I'm going to offer what I think are three possible solutions in Professor Sunstein's analysis. I know the focus has been on break-even analysis, but I kind of see three possibilities in what he says. One is, of course, break-even analysis. Another is a meaningful recognition of qualitative consequences, non-quantified consequences. And then third is a redoubled effort to quantify and monetize, even when it gets hard, even when things are tricky, to try to quantify and monetize. Um, I believe, sadly, uh, that this, these solutions uh, fall short, and therefore we still face the hard question with which we started, is what do we do in cases in which the uh, quantified costs stated in dollar terms seem pretty big, but we're not for a variety of reasons, able to quantify or monetize the benefits. And I want to explain the reasons why I think that these solutions fall short. I want to explain them, this by reference to three um, different uh, sets of social problems and rules with respect to those social problems. The problems are water pollution, the rights of the disabled, and uh, rape and sexual assault. 
So with respect to water pollution and break-even analysis, uh, water pollution rules are one of Professor Sunstein's recurring examples, and rightly so. They are a classic example of a case where it's very difficult even to quantify the benefits, to know exactly what water pollution uh, rules will do in the ecosystem. Um, it's also very difficult to monetize the benefits for these rules. Oftentimes as well, water pollution rules produce benefits that are far out in the future and not so much in the present. That produces difficulties if we um, use an operation called discounting. And so for a lot of reasons, water pollution rules, um, even compared to other environmental rules, which are not hugely successful, a lot of them under cost-benefit, water pollution rules don't fare very well. And in fact, if you look at the history just in the last few years of water pollution rules at OIRA, it hasn't been tremendous. There was just a water pollution proposal issued very recently on uh, toxics coming from power plants. That rule was, rec was unrecognizable, in my opinion. Um, in the form it took when it came out of OIRA from, compared to the form it took going in. So it was changed deeply, made much more weaker, in my opinion, than when it um, went in. There is a, a rule on um, guidance. How far does the Clean Water Act extend? Um, that, uh, that guidance has been at uh, the White House for 18 months, over 18 months. So the point in water pollution rules are the kinds of rules I think we're talking about here tonight, hard to quantify, hard to monetize, will often fail cost-benefit analysis. We also see in practice they're getting stuck or they're getting uh, changed um, quite dramatically during the process of regulatory review. And so the question I'd have is why weren't they thrown the lifeline of break-even analysis? One of the ways that I think of break-even analysis um, is oh, it's almost as a lifeline. It's like a rescue mission. A rule that otherwise would get stuck and fail cost-benefit analysis gets this lifeline even though some significant portion of the benefits aren't quantified or monetized or maybe both. And so it becomes, in my opinion, a really important question to ask which rules get the lifeline and which rules don't. It turns out I can't find any environmental rules that have gotten the lifeline. There are none in the written uh, version of the um, remarks Professor Sunstein delivered. There are 26 rules listed in a, in a chart. None are environmental rules. I did a search on regulations.gov. You know regulations.gov? Fabulous. Fabulous. I spend way too much time on regulations.gov. I did a search. I could not find any environmental rules that have gotten the lifeline of break-even analysis. And so I think it's fair to ask. It's fair to ask. I don't know the answer, but it's fair to ask. Um, what are the other kinds of rules that do get it and how are they different? And so I looked at the rules in the chart in the paper and they're terrorism related rules, they're rules on transportation security, and they're rules on disclosure, disclosure policies. Almost all of the rules are one of those three things. And so my question is, is it possible, is it possible that the rules get the lifeline when they're already preferred on other grounds? In other words, they get that lifeline because they don't need to be saved. But the rules that are in trouble on other grounds don't get the lifeline. And in that way, if that's right, I'm not sure it is, but if it is, then break-even analysis is a way of deepening the role of intuition and dogma on the regulatory process, not a, not a way of softening it, it deepens it. Second. On uh, the a second strategy for solving the problem of qu non-quantifiability is to meaningfully uh, recognize qualitative uh, benefits. And here I want to discuss with reference to the rights th of the disabled. And here I think Professor Sunstein is absolutely right that this emphasis on human dignity is new to the executive orders on cost-benefit analysis, that's for sure. I also want to say I'm in favor of human dignity. Um, but I, I'm not sure in this context that dignity needed a, a rescue mission. Um, the emphasis on dignity in EO 13563, that's the Obama executive order, EO 13563, um, saves some rules that might otherwise fail the cost-benefit analysis that the executive order requires. And so it's a way of saving, in my view, maybe this puts it too strongly, cost-benefit from itself. 
In other words, otherwise cost-benefit might tell us that rights of the disabled aren't very important or rules against discrimination and so forth. And so it feels to me like maybe those were rules that didn't need, need saving but for the executive order that recognized, um, uh, that also recognized their importance. In that case, it's not clear that there's been that much gained um, through that uh, executive order. And indeed, if you look at the Department of Justice's ultimate decision on um, a rule with respect to access to public spaces by the disabled, it didn't turn on cost-benefit analysis. The statute didn't turn on cost-benefit analysis. So what you have is an elaborate, over 400-page analysis that at the end of the day didn't connect with the statutory requirement. This is Dan Farber's point at the end of his talk. And that didn't uh, play a role in uh, the ultimate decision, except that except that the, the uh, break-even analysis was discussed by the Department of Justice in discussing how it had satisfied the executive order's requirement on cost-benefit analysis. And so that I wonder whether this analysis um, does that much work except to, again, uh, satisfy the cost-benefit analysis required by the same executive order. I'd also say, and this is a, a little bit tricky as well, that the discussion of dignity in the context of a cost-benefit analysis seems very off to me. And I understand the arguments about we're going to value these items anyway and we're going to have a limited amount to spend and so forth. But bear in mind, the cost-benefit analysis is not doing the legal work in this rule. Cost-benefit analysis is not the thing justifying the, where we stopped uh, the rule. And in that case, it is just downright um, strange to read a sentence like the following. The Department of Justice is discussing requirements for bathrooms with outward swinging doors. Turns out inward swinging doors cost more money. Outward swinging doors. And um, uh, access requirements that would allow uh, people in wheelchairs to be able to get onto the toilet from the side, the way they're trained, rather than, uh, rather than otherwise. And would be able to use the bathroom facilities without assistance from another person. Right. And here the Department of Justice says, uh, for the costs and benefits of this access rule to break even, people with the relevant disabilities will have to value safety, independence, and the avoidance of stigma and humiliation at just under five cents per use. And that just, that just feels, I don't think it's just a matter of the English being awkward. I don't think it's just a matter of it being written by a bureaucracy. It feels like it gets something about dignity wrong. It feels like it treats it as something that comes in uses or packages, times, right? It's different for inward swinging doors and outward swinging doors, maybe for bathrooms and swimming pools. It just feels, it just feels off. It's as if someone misunderstood what dignity is. A third way, I think, um, that I can see in Professor Sunstein's analysis uh, that we might surmount the problem of non-quantifiability is to redouble our efforts to quantify and um, monetize. And here we try not to shrink from quantifying and monetizing, even when it's really hard, even when we're faced with a really tough problem. Um, so I think this is one way to understand what the Department of Justice did in the rules on uh, avoiding rape in prisons. Right? You'd think that you might shrink from the task of deciding what the monetary value of avoiding rape and sexual assault is, but the Department of Justice did not shrink from it. Um, you might also think that of all things, all things, violent crime would not be susceptible to the kind of economic analysis we've talked about uh, tonight. It's not consensual by definition. So to ask, as the Justice Department did in this rule, how much would you accept in money in order to be raped seems, again, to misunderstand what rape is. It seems to simply misunderstand what the crime is, misunderstand the circumstances in which it occurs. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that that was a ba step backwards rather than forwards. And indeed, in the Department of Justice's cost-benefit analysis of avoiding rape and sexual assault in prisons, they ended up with 
uh, what they called a hierarchy of rape and sexual assault, 17 different varieties, right, different values attached to it, it, it and, um, and then produced an analysis that at the end of the day didn't actually make a difference to the rule. So again, just as with the rights of the disabled, at the end of the day, the statutory standard was not cost-benefit analysis, as Professor Farber has said. Uh, it had to do with looking at the costs in the context of running the prison system. So at the end of the day, all of this analysis was there, 17 different categories of rape and sexual assault, and it didn't pay, play a role in the ultimate decision. So here again, I want to ask, and here's where I'll end it with a, with a somewhat tricky question, is do we gain information in that exercise, or did we lose it? It seems to me, I think the temptation is to think you always gain when you get more numbers, you have more tables, you have more varieties and categories and hierarchies, and you think, of course we gained information, of course we're better off. I'm not sure we are. I'm not sure we gained information. I think what we lost in that exercise is what rape is. And that seems to me to be a, a real loss. So to conclude, I uh, applaud what Professor Sunstein is doing and trying to do. I don't think that at the end of the day it helps to, uh, uh, it, the rescue minute mission for cost benefit uh, works. Thanks so much. Okay, I'm, I'm uh, really grateful for those terrific remarks. And since we're all friends by now, those of you who stayed, I'll tell you something from inside government, which was during my confirmation process, which was unbelievably horrible and a nightmare. And if I start crying or screaming in the next 30 seconds, it was really hurtful and painful. Uh, animals came up a lot because I did some things on animal rights. And uh, so the sea otter comment reminded me of this. So someone who was working for me thought we should create a website called onlythecutest.gov. <laughs> would, that, would that have helped in the confirmation process? Um, OK, so there, there are many great points here, and I can only uh, scratch the surface a little bit. Uh, I think Professor Revez has two points, both of which are really important. Uh, one is the permeability of the difference between the quantifiable and the not. So something might not be non-quantifiable today, it's quantifiable tomorrow. Now, there are cases where some of the things Professor Heitzerling said might make you think that's a loss. That's fine. If so, it undoubtedly is so in some cases. But let's just uh, stipulate there are some cases where that would be a good thing to be able to do. And as we get more information, we will. And that will lead to um, more informed judgments. Uh, so that permeability point's really good. Also, the point about uh, non-quantifiability and break-even analysis is a second at best. There's a train along which that's exactly right. And keep in mind, if you would, the sheer capaciousness of the federal regulatory universe. So you have an agency that's trying to reduce the risk of a financial meltdown. It's doing something, let's say, that's going to cost a lot of money, and real people are going to bear those costs. They might be consumers, they might be workers, they might be shareholders. What good thing is that going to do that's going to impose those costs? It'd be really good to know, wouldn't it? And that's the area where non-quantifiability slash break-even analysis really is a second best. We'd like to know, does this increase the financial stability such that the expected value is high? Or we have a rule involving transportation, which is going to cost truck drivers and little companies that run tr truck, that have trucks a lot of money. Is it going to save lives? How many? That would be good to know, right, to know if it's justified. So the permeability and the second best point, I think, are really good. Um, Professor Farber makes also some excellent points. He's uh, questioning break-even analysis by reference to uh, risks of error on the part of the bureaucrats who might not see the worst case scenario and who, or who might do the wrong translation exercise. Both of those are really important points. I think they're within the family points. They're not external critiques. So the break-even analyst needs to do break-even analysis properly and not by having upper and lower bounds that are ridiculously optimistic or pessimistic. 
and not by having dumb translations. So the, the, absolutely right. They're, they're important, I think, w inside the family uh, concerns. The reason why I want to emphasize that is it can't be that if bureaucrats are prone to error, the alternative is not for all those criticisms go, don't do break-even analysis for the reasons Professor Revez gave. You don't want to ignore the costs of greenhouse gas emissions because the bureaucrats may lowball. Okay. okay. In terms of the alternatives, one set of alternatives he described, if you remember, and you've been very patient, is to try to be more quantitative than break-even analysis allows. That's in the spirit of Professor Revez's comment. I think that's a very good suggestion. I agree with that. Uh, another thought is to be deferential to Congress or to make a political judgment. If there's something to defer to on Congress's part, by all means, they make the law, as Professor Heinzerling emphasizes. But I'm talking about categories where there isn't, there isn't a there there, as Gertrude Stein said of Oakland. Is that okay to say? Okay, uh, so, uh, so there's that. So if there's not something to defer to, which is typically there isn't in the cases I've been discussing, I think, or at least frequently enough, uh, the uh, category of the political judgment, I confess, um, I, I worry about. What does that mean exactly? President Obama likes cost-benefit analysis. According to Professor Farber, President Bush liked libertarianism and some future president likes environmental precaution. I, I'm just not sure what the content of the political is and its relationship to what we the people think. So uh, transparency and accountability are really good, and you get that at a level of specificity. I think with break-even analysis, if it's working well, that you're not going to get if there's this category called the political that's, um, that's uh, operating. Professor Heinzeling raises a number of quite fundamental thoughts, and I'm really only going to be able to scratch the surface uh, there. Uh, the idea of... Um, of uh, uh, break-even analysis as a lifeline. I, I don't think of it quite that way, though I see how she does. I, I see, if it, see it as part of a million, John Stewart, a form of cost-benefit analysis. That is one that doesn't disregard things because you can't reduce them to monetary equivalents or numbers, either because human life isn't like that or because we just don't know. So I see it as not a lifeline, but because you don't know whether to send something a lifeline until you've analyzed it. You want to send it a lifeline if it might stink, and you don't want to disregard the potential of a lifeline if it might be terrific. And you need to be able to engage in the break-even analysis to figure out what to do. So there isn't an antecedent judgment, lifeline yes or lifeline no. The, this is designed to be the apparatus to decide what we go forward with. It is a very interesting question she raises about in what cases the, uh, the break-even analysis is operating. There are some environmental cases where it does operate, um, and it's certainly on the table analytically for the water pollution cases. It has to be. It has to be. That's, it's, it's crucial to take that into account. And I agree with her that if there are areas where it's systematically not included, that needs that, that demands explanation. Okay, on the disabled case, um, okay, there's a universe of things that can be done to make life for people who have mental or physical disabilities more like life is like for people who don't have those things. Yes, there's a universe of things can, that can be done. Um, what can be done exactly has to turn, doesn't it, at some level on what resource commitment is best. And it, to ignore the dignitary value would be doubly tragic. It would be tragic because it would be making Bentham's mistake first and would be tragic because it would be according no economic value to something that deserves it second. So when we're deciding what to do to make life for people who are struggling, let's say, with severe depression better, there has to be some judgment, doesn't there, about, and there's a dignitary value there, even though it's less visible than if your legs don't work. There has to be some judgment about resources. 
And there's probably, the more you spend, the better it's going to get. And there has to be a point at which you're not going to spend more. And I don't think that ignores the meaning of the word dignity, to make that judgment. It's, it's very, very uncomfortable. But the point of the break-even analysis is to be clear about what we're going to be doing explicitly to people who include people who are disabled, which is saying, you know, we're going to do this much, and it's worth it. And if we're not going to do that much on the ground that it doesn't seem to be, is that a mistake? Now, the five cent idea, it does seem preposterous, doesn't it? But note that that is an endorsement of an aggressive protection of people who need access. That's the context, to say it's got to be worth it. Look at the, how little it costs. And in cases that involve, well, I'll give, uh, so as not to talk about stuff that happened, I'm just going to give a stylized case that isn't wildly unrealistic. There's a question about how much access to give people in terms of retrofitting buildings. Let's stipulate there are cases that involve something, bathrooms, small classrooms, where the monetized benefits don't justify the monetized costs. Surely that's imaginable. Is that the end of the game? No, because of dignity. Does the invocation of the word dignity mean we do the retrofitting? That can't be. If the people who are being populated are few in numbers, and the help being given to them is small, and the cost is a zillion, that's not a good allocation. But to disregard it is the million problem and the undervaluation problem, and then we're right there in break-even analysis. Okay, as uncomfortable as it is, the rape case at least it's not in a different conceptual universe. Prison rape, it would be good to eliminate it. It'd be great to eliminate it. But the resources that would be required to drive it down to zero prison rape in the next year, that's a challenge. So once you're doing that, you're engaged in some valuation. Note, and this is the point on which I'll end, the prison rape rule was an extremely controversial rule in many, in many quarters. And it was proposed and regarded by many as uh, underprotective. The very rule that had a very complicated and, uh, you know, I think to the million, rightly jarring, we'd lose our moral, um, I think Professor Hanselin is right, we'd lose our moral moorings if we thought that the economic analysis captured everything that was at stake. That economic analysis was part of a very strong present rape, prison rape rule which was regarded by state and local government as adequately responsive to their concerns, and also stunningly in an era in which economic challenges are being faced severely by uh, state and local government, which the prison population isn't the number one priority for people. It was regarded by the prison rate rights advocates as an extraordinary achievement. And that was part and parcel of a rule that had the most detailed break-even analysis of a problem of the sort in American history. Thanks. Thank you very much for quantifying your appreciation as best you could. There is a reception.